If you knew your history, then you know where you're coming from. Give a hand clap, please. The legendary Jamaican reggae singer Bob Marley. If you knew your history, then you would know where you're coming from. What's your name, madam? What's your name? Aduke Gomez. I didn't get that. Aduke? Aduke Gomez. Aduke Gomez. A warm welcome to Aduke Gomez. Please make your way up the podium and join the distinguished panel. Aduke Gomez. Right. Um, Africa is full of stories, as we, we just saw. It's full of stories, you know, and, and, and some of these stories I personally had no clue about, and probably you too, but we're going to talk about all that in just a few minutes. Let me take this opportunity to, to introduce another panelist, a uh, creative mind, a genius. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Jide Martin, founder of the Comic Republic based right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Jide Martin. Welcome. Yes, please. Right, and last but not least, I want to introduce to you Mr. Christoph, Professor Christopher Ogbogbo, an expert on African history. Welcome to the podium. It's a pleasure to have you all at this panel discussion, My History, My African Roots. Right. I see there are some changes happening. I did not authorize that, but okay. <laughs> uh, please take a seat. Ah, okay, okay. You want to move closer? Okay. Excellent. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe begin uh, and open up the discussion with a question to uh, Professor Ogbogbo. When I was in school, I remember learning my history. And part of that history in, involved mostly about uh, uh, the, the, the Second World War, the French Revolution, and, and stuff like that. I'm not a student anymore. That was long years back. I don't know what kind of history Nigerian students are learning now, or from whatever country, Tanzanian students. But what do you think? Is the history being taught in schools now? Is it what reflects what the continent has been through? Does it reflect what the continent has been through and where it is right now? Thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying that um, the history we study now, we just, for Nigeria, history has been in limbo for the past 34 years. And by that I mean history as a discipline was yanked off the curriculum, school curriculum, for primary and junior secondary schools. That's the first nine years of a child's education. And so we have not been studying any. Sorry about that, sorry. And so we've not been studying history as a discipline. However, before 1984, when it was yanked off the curriculum, what existed with the older generation, our own father's generation, the history that was taught during the colonial period was the history of European activities in Africa. And that was why we had textbooks in history Asserting, for instance, that Mongo Park discovered the Niger. Mongo Park, European, his activities in Africa. You learned about David Livingstone, the Landa brothers, and so on. But with the establishment of the University of Ibadan and the introduction of African history focused on Africans and African activities, we began to do some substantial study of Africans. So, 
we have courses on West African history, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and so on. When history was therefore yanked off the curriculum, and we got to this point where in 2018, it was reintroduced after a series of efforts, there was the need to recalibrate the entire curriculum. And so what we have now is a Nigerian-focused curriculum. I call it the policy of three concentric circles. A child in Lagos, for instance, we have to study first about his, his or her environment, the local government areas, the traditional rulers there, and so on. From the local government, you graduate to the state, and from the state to the entire country. So it is Nigerian-focused. It is in your ninth year, the child's ninth year, that is JSS3, that the child begins to talk about some very little dose of West African history. From what I've said, we started with European activities. We graduated to studying some African history, and then we yanked everything off for 34 years. And then just in 2018, it was reintroduced that has become Nigerian-centric. Nigerian focused. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I don't know, uh, are you Nigerian? Yes, I am. You're Nigerian. I understand that Nigeria has what, more than 450 ethnic groups. Is that true? Yeah. That is true. About that. About that. It's not even sure. <laughs> Nobody's sure. Okay. Uh, From which ethnic group are you? And, and what can you tell us about your group? Where did they come from, for example? Do you have any, any history of where your ethnic group comes from? Um, yes, I do. My name is Ad Aduke Gomez. Um, you can, if you're Nigerian, you can tell that my first name is Yoruba. Mm -hmm. I'm from Lagos State. Um, you can tell from my surname, which is Gomez, and that tells you of the historical links that Lagos had with the transatlantic slave trade. Because Lagos was a key port during the transatlantic slave trade. And at, during the abolition period, many enslaved persons returned and settled in Lagos. And my ancestor was one of them. Luckily for us, we know quite a bit about him. He was captured in the 1820s from a place called Owu. He was taken to Bahia. He was there for over 20 years, came back and settled in Lagos in the 1840s. Wow, let's give her a hand clap. I mean, I'm impressed that she knows. Uh, it's almost like a lesson, a history lesson. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I'll come back to you later. But let, let me turn to Jide. Jide is the... Um, uh, founder of uh, Comic Republic, and they're the people behind the animation that you see displayed on the screens. Did you tell us a bit about your experience working with the African Roots Project? How much has that changed your perception as an African, and, and in any case, what, what has it taught you, if anything? Um, okay, so my experience first was, you know, I first started with so much appreciation for the fact that um, people cared enough to help us document our history. Um, and I went into a bit of shock because in the process of doing this project, you know, we basically had to search and we found out how lacking we are as a continent in documenting our history. Um, you know, it was pretty weird that we had to look at important resources to find out a lot about the people who moved Africa as a whole, and the resources we got here were not as much as the um, information we got abroad. What that means is that we as a continent, we're not doing enough to record and document our um, history, right? And I, I, it dawned on me one of the issues that we were having as a whole was that one of the 
reasons why we're not moving forward is that we're not learning from our mistakes because we don't even know what our mistakes are, right, in the first place. And so it made it more relevant to me why it was important and why I was grateful to be part of this process. Because there are some things the internet never forgets. I'm sure you guys know that, right? And one of the major things about what happens is, is that it's, most of it is being you know, um, transferred or disseminated through um, online methods. And hence, what that means is that at the end of the, when we're done with you know, creating this history, which is based on facts, it will be well documented in a place that could not or will always be found, which is online, right? And now, you know, generations to come will be able to go online and find out what, you know, um, people like Queen Sheba 3,000 years ago, what they did, you know, that pushed Africa forward. Um, yeah, so that, that has been, it's been, you know, I moved from shock, you know, to joy and now, and excitement, and now I'm um, grateful that we're doing something, knowing where we're from and who we are. Okay, thanks, Gita. Just to remind you that uh, this panel discussion is being streamed live on our DW Africa Facebook page and also on DW Africa YouTube page. And the hashtag, if you want to tweet, is right behind us, hashtag SMWLagos2020, and also hashtag African Roots. Feel free to tag your friends. Um, and welcome to all those who are joining us on, uh, on, on Facebook and YouTube as well. Now, Carol, uh, let me turn to you. Um, you're very active in, in, in promoting um, uh, 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 gender equality and, and, and also uh, rights of women in Tanzania and, and across the continent. Uh, when it comes to African history, what do you make of the contribution by women? Because sometimes I have the impression that um, uh, uh, women's contribution has been somewhat downplayed or, or neglected and is not being, being told as much and as strongly as the men. What is your impression? Well, I de definitely... Um, hello. Okay. I definitely agree. Um, and and it, it is precisely because of that that I started an initiative called the 100 Tanzanian Hello. Okay. Which basically spotlights. Hello. Okay. Yeah. So it's precisely because of what you've just mentioned that um, I was inspired to start the initiative called the Hundred Tanzanian Sheroes, spotlighting a hundred women every year. So we started in 2018. Um, we had an edition in 2019, and we're looking forward to the 2020 edition. And it is because of just that women are not celebrated, and it's really. Um, downing because even the women themselves, like in, in our case in Tanzania, even when they make strides, however little, how, you know, however little steps they make, they don't pat themselves at the back. But a man buys a new mobile phone and hey, you know, people are like, hey, you know, congratulations. <laughs> but we have been forgotten. We have, um, as, as Gide mentioned, we don't have, we don't track our own history. So. I've been inspired to, to find out about female you know, legends who have uh, contributed to, to basically our independence in Tanzania, and it was always a challenge, always a challenge. But you try to also find out about the rest of Africa, you know, Mekateli Menza, you try to find out about Queen Zinga, you try to find out about Queen Sheba, you rarely find information. And I've, I, I also found out that most of the narrative was if I may, from a colonial perspective, because it was exactly at that time that, you know, these movements. So even the in there, you, you can see that it is, if it's not underlined by a patriarchal tone, you know, it, it's lacking in a lot of facts. So definitely, but I believe that we're also in the digital age right now, it presents us with a great opportunity. And we've seen a lot of young people, a lot of women who have taken social media, taken to social media and, using digital storytelling to tell their stories and own the narrative, you know? For example, I always um, speak about how as, as Africans, we, do not, we don't localize the context and we always jump on this ship of sloganeerism. So I, for one, don't support the concept of women empowerment because of just that word, empowerment. 
because it's semantics, yes, but if we don't get the semantics right, then we're not getting anything right. Language is everything. And to me, empowerment means that it's coming from a person who believes they have the power and they can empower me, but I already have my power. So even with development programs and other people who are coming from outside to Africa, they do not acknowledge what we already have. Because if I took a woman from, for example, Geneva and told her to survive in a village in Arusha, they wouldn't be able to, you know? That livelihood that we already have is, I would say, ignored. And they come and they try to impose the popular, or rather, I would say, the global North popular narrative, you know? But if we take local ownership of our own narrative and say, you know what, yes, I would love for you to support me, for example, with digital skills so that I can advance in my personal and professional development. But listen here, I've also been able to do A, B, C, and D. You know, you can also learn from me. So I feel that that is always lacking and we as Africans, we really need to take a step. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, I think, I mean, nice things are being said here. And uh, I appreciate that. But when we come to, to the reality that's on the ground, we find that um, it's difficult to, to, tell, to tell some of these stories, either because uh, uh, we lack uh, the means, we lack the resources, or people are not interested. Um, times have changed as well. I mean, I, when I was growing up, I listened to so many stories, and, and I loved listening to stories, oral stories. Like, that are told by teachers or, or parents or grandparents. But I think we are at a time in our lives where it's hard for somebody to just sit and, 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 and listen to a story about how, you know, how, how either slaves were taken from Africa. How do we tell these stories in a way that does not take out what really happened, but at the same time, um, captures the imagination of this uh, uh, younger generation that is in Africa. How do we do that? Any, anyone can, can take that on. All right. I think that... I think the key is to have... to make the story engaging. And I think that with respect to pro Professor, a lot of our history, at least in Nigeria, is kept in, oh, it's history. It's for academics. It's not brought out and made available to the consumers, okay? If you compare the West, they're always making films, cartoons. Everybody, I mean, like in the UK, knows about the Tudors because every so often there's a film, there's a cartoon. Henry VIII killed his six wives. We don't have those kind of tropes. We don't, our history is kept. It's in, it's, it's, it's locked in textbooks, it's not brought out and seen as something that can be used as a tool for entertainment. And if it's not done that, and if the stories are not told in engaging ways, history can be looked at as though it's quite a boring, dry subject. But when the story is told engagingly, then I believe that young people who need to know these stories will engage with it. Chris, I, I was actually going to cue in Jide because, you know, he's doing that. But I feel that in this particular case, and especially since it's social media week, we really need to talk about the appetite of the African people and how we can appeal to that appetite, you know? So I love African roots and I love what Jide is doing. I was totally wowed today, you know, in the morning when he showed me the link to all this animation. And I feel that that is what will appeal because one of the things that we're trying to push for right now is changing the pedagogy, you know, um, and we're saying we should be able to learn through play. And the young people or children, you know, early childhood development, that is what appeals to them. So that would be an entry point and I'm so glad that you have Africans who are actually pioneering that movement and we need more GDs. <laughs> you know, for every generation to, to tell any story, you need to understand the voice of that generation at that point in time. You need to understand the voice that they're speaking in, and you also need to understand the voice that they want to be talked to, all right? And then we need to adopt whatever it is, information, or um, whatever it is that we're trying to pass across in that voice. And right now, there's a big move for what, entertainment, right? Because basically, everybody has a screen. It's either your TV screen, your mobile screen, whatever it is. Everything is always displayed on the screen. 
and these days because i don't know the world is the way it is uh, there's a lot of depression going around everybody wants to be lightened right we're always looking for a more funny and a more expressive a simpler way to tell our story and i think uh, um, you know the third important part is that the, the information dissemination has moved away from the big uh, bodies and institutions and actually have now moved to the individuals, right? Most of the social media platforms are actually relying on you to send out the information, right? So people are tweeting about things, but if we now take it into our hands and the same way we, we make light of serious issues, Nigerians are people that I know that somebody is dead and will make fun of it and everybody will still laugh, right? But if we're talking about our history or something we found out about, more me, for example, man, that babe just be betrayed the Bini people shall. Do you get? People are going to wonder why did she do that? And that's what we're doing at Comic Republic, where we're, we're, we're telling the stories in um, comic animation format, so that because it's the language that people these days understand. You tell any young person Naruto, they get what you're saying. Naruto is a Japanese um, thing, but you tell them something about Shongo, they're like, they want to stay away. And that's because we've told it to be negative. But if we take it into our own hands, make it fun, make it entertaining and interesting, and then we pass the message out ourselves and not waiting for someone else to do it, I think our history will move on quickly. Thank you. I want to comment on your question from another perspective. And that is to say that until recently, the last two generations, the African, precisely the Nigerian, has a very strong sense of history. Because it was oral, it guided everything. You determine knowledge of history. Land matters are decided upon based on our knowledge of history. Who becomes the traditional ruler of a town? is based on our knowledge of history. When colonialism came, our histories now became such that until it is written, and so those of us who went to school, it became a thing of go to school, memorize. When we now put a stop to the study of history, it meant that a very big vacuum was created what we now have with the reintroduction of history is to say the ones we studied in the 60s, 70s, 80s, what were the inadequacies we noticed and how do we rectify those inadequacies in contemporary times? And that is where the work of GD comes in, the African roots thing. We realize that it cannot, my children cannot study history the way I did. They are a generation of watching films. They are on their phones always. So you have to meet them at their point of interest. It can no longer be just read, memorize. So you are reducing very serious issues in Nigerian history into comics. And they will easily assimilate. Into visuals. She talked about films. For the more advanced um, people in society, we are talking about faction. When a Chimamanda writes, um, half of a yellow song, you read it, those who don't have any sense of the, Nigerian, the history of the Nigerian civil war, we begin to appreciate now some enlightenment with regards to that war. And so, it's a project not just for the professional historian. Yes, he's there to verify the facts. But people who are creative like him, our writers, we forge uh, alliances with Association of Nigerian Authors so that they begin to write novels that we tell about our society. We begin to produce films like Nollywood that we reflect the history of the people. There should be a film on, for instance, Yemoja. There should be a film on Moremi. I'm talking for the big ladies in the Yoruba uh, uh, group. What is true of that? The Aba women riot. 
you want to do a film on that to see what actually happened. I know that the past editions of African Roots, we had something on Ransom Kuti's mother, Fela's mother. Yes, Fumilayo. All that helps us without consciously saying we are studying history in the class to begin to reinvent our history. And for our youths that are majority around today, we discovered that our history texts did not project our heroes and heroines. So if you look at the textbooks we have written and the kind of thing, things we want to make, we want heroes and heroines they can relate with in contemporary times. A young girl should look at someone like Okonjo Iwala as a heroine. People they can relate with, which will, that can influence them. And so it becomes our duty using all these channels to project such personalities. Thank you. I absolutely agree, and um, I wrote a children's book recently, which actually has done quite well. And what I did was, the, the characters in the book are modern day, but they explore the history of Lagos around them. Like, they go to an Ayo masquerade, so the history of that is told. They go past um, race course, which is where our independence flag was, was, was lowered. And those kind of comments, just sort of hidden in the book, have allowed children who have, have, have read it from the feedback I've got from their parents and even from teachers, that they've made the children actually go out to find out more about the trail that has been left for them to follow. Right, thank you. Um, um, I, I kind of agree and I disagree a little bit with Professor. Um, because when we... <laughs> Like I said, I, I come from the old school, and I, I, I'm the type of uh, generation that learned that David Livingstone is the one who discovered Lake Victoria, and uh, you know, they renamed it. It, was, it used to be called Lake Sango by the locals, and then it became Lake Victoria, and it's still known today as Lake Victoria. And the same with Lake Turkana was Lake Rudolph in Kenya, that is. So what happens to my generation, you know, those that learned uh, uh, this sort of thing. You know, we, we, we were taught, for example, that uh, uh, Dedan Kimati was a terrorist because the, the British colonialists considered him a terrorist. And, and there are many such kind of histories that still exist to this day, and they're contradictory to what we are now trying to propagate, and that is the true history of the African. How do we, how do we mix the two? And Because if you do research now, and, and, and um, Philip is here. When we've been trying to dig out some of the history of this uh, portrait, someone like Bibi Titi from Tanzania, uh, she, she participated in the struggle for independence in, in Tanzania. You, you can hardly find anything about her. Not even one soundbite exists of this woman. And she was a very key figure. So how do you, how do you meet, how do you blend these, these two different parts? Okay. Thank you. In intellectual circles generally, you talk about knowledge production. Who is producing that knowledge and for who? The history you talked about, Lake Victoria, the point she made about gender, marginalization, and so on, disempowerment, quotes. These are reflections of our colonial past. Let me start with the gender perspective. The African woman, our great grandmothers, they were not in any way disempowered. Even within the patriarchal system, they were not disempowered. They played prominent roles in societies, and the researches we have done justify these positions I'm taking. However, with the coming of colonial rule, and the writing of our history from their perspective, they began to emphasize the things they wanted to see colored by their perspective. That meant that 
Victorian England that was heavily patriarchal imposed on its colonies the disempowerment of women. I give you an example. In Igbo society, a recent example, they had female quote and unquote kings. Females inherited land, had palm trees and so on. All that were wiped away during the colonial period. They are just beginning to reinvent that. For our generation, what one of my teachers, Professor E. Ayondele, calls the deluded hybrid. You are neither fully African nor European. Because you have the, you, you are exposed to this And then you are exposed a bit to the African way. What that does to you is that it creates a distortion. It will now take further enlightenment, like you know, Chris, now that, yes, you have a local word for Lake Victoria, different from Lake Victoria. That is a product of enlightenment. So within your circles, you begin to re-emphasize it. When that enlightenment came to some African countries, you see the renaming of their countries, like Burkina Faso. Ivory Coast became Côte d'Ivoire. They began to change. It is true that we cannot run away from our colonial experience. It is part of our history. You just introduced me as Chris. It's part of the fact that my father grew up under and was educated during the colonial period when it was trendy to give your son an english name or a christian name because an african name cannot be christian today all my children bear traditional nigerian names none bears anything that you say okay it's a christian or you cannot identify him based on religion. So it's a new wave, a new consciousness. What we therefore need is to sustain the current consciousness for quite a number of time. It will begin to yield fruits, but it will not be something that will be immediate. We need to sustain it, and then we need to be able to spread it across the African continent. It's not just a Nigerian problem. It's just not a West African problem. It's an African problem. Sorry for taking so much time. My last example, take the issue of um, the mass migration of our youth from the Sahel Savannah area through the Sahara to the Mediterranean, trying to cross into Europe. Any person with a strong sense of history, we know that what is happening is a second slave trade. And they use the same slave route. Precisely. And so that sense of history is sufficient if you have it to dissuade that youth from embarking on such a trip. But if that person does, is not sufficiently conscious, is not aware that such a Reese back is going to fall into the same trap and then blame history for his or her mistakes. Okay. Thank you. Can I just say yeah. something quickly about you know one of the things that African Ruth has taught me, right? Is, is basically like what she said, female empowerment. I hear that thing and I laugh, right? You know, I literally want to re, re tag the name African Ruth to female African Ruth because I've learned how very powerful women actually saved most of what we know as Nigeria. I don't want to go into how Moremi single-handedly saved the people of Ife from Benin. I don't want to go into how Queen Amina basically saved her people, or even Madame Tinubu. We can go on and on about how strong African women actually shaped the continent as it is now. But yet, yet you keep hearing female empowerment when in truth is they empowered us. 
So these are the reasons why we need things like African roots, where we know these things, and even women know their place in society, understanding that even they can be forces to reckon with in creating history and moving a people forward. You want to say something? Yes, I wanted to uh, sort of like pose a challenge as well to ourselves, obviously, and to the audience. Uh, at what point do we stop the blaming game? You know, at what point do we always refer back to colonialism? At what point, as a continent, do we draw a line between moving forward, being a contemporary society, but also being authentic as an African continent and sticking to our roots? Because I feel like that's also something that they're very blurred lines right now to be an educated African um, and an elite in the society, uh, excuse the class, um, the class segmentation, but to be that, you have to have an accent, you have to have a degree, you have to have a big castle, you have to have a four by four car, you know? But what does that mean, or what does it mean to be an African in today's world? I feel like that is the question that we really need to keep on asking ourselves, and from that, that is where, where we'll draw the inspiration to, you know, produce that knowledge that would resonate with the situation right now. When you started the session, you, you asked, you know, if you don't know your history, you don't know where you're going from. You we're not saying that we should be set in the ways of the past. However, it does shape future. He spoke about, you know, knowing where you went wrong. And that is exactly what history serves. That is exactly what our roots serve. For example, if we didn't go through colonization, probably we would not be so adamant and so, you know, driven to change our narrative right now. But I really feel that that's a question that we really need to keep on asking ourselves. At what point, or where do you draw the line? Where does one, uh, how do you identify yourself as an African with strong roots and still be able to exist in the global world today? Thank you, Carol. Um, I want to open now the panel to the audience. If you have any questions, the panelists, feel free to ask. We don't have so much time, but I'll try to taking as many questions as possible. So if you have any questions to the panelists concerning the discussion that we are having, please feel free to ask. There's a gentleman there. Yeah. Afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah, so I just want to ask, because um, when we talk about African history, we have to talk about where it has to be uh, spoken about for people to know, which is schools. Over there in America, at least from the videos I watch, they have Black History Month where they talk about Black History, and even that sometimes is perverted. But how do we replicate the same thing in Africa where we actually tell our children what actually happened? Because even I, I don't know some of the things that have happened in the past, but how can we savage the generation that is growing up? Because they are the ones that will form the thought. So what effort is being made or put in place to actually educate these children and even the adults some who, who have forgotten and some who might not have experienced it. How are we trying to read them about where we are coming from so that we know where we actually go to? Mm -hmm. um, just to quickly answer your question, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you that most of what we know now as a generation wasn't gotten from school. And that immediately is your answer, right? We cannot depend on schools or institutions anymore to push this message across. Right? I was telling people that we need to be able to reach out as influencers. And as an influencer, it doesn't mean that you're a very powerful person. It just means you have a medium or an audience in which people can listen to you. Right? Most people here have an Instagram account. Most people here have a Facebook account. And most, I, I, I wake up one morning and I see a new trend. I see the most silly trend and everybody's posting it. Right? There was something about Instagram, Twitter, and something the other time where you put yourself in various versions, right? So, I mean, why doesn't somebody start up and say, rep your tribe, right? And you say, your Igbo version, your Hausa version, your this version, and this version, or talk about your heritage, right? Basically, what I'm trying to say is that even though the schools have a, a, a part to play, we're constantly growing into a world, and that's the truth, where the schools are not that relevant anymore. Most people learn most of what they learn via social media and YouTube, right? And when we're creating content, it's now left for us as influencers, even if you have just 20 people, 50 people, 250 people, 1 million people following you, to push the half African history and African heritage and whatever it is. And, you know, heritage doesn't also have to be about the past. Your heritage is who you are, what you're doing, 
we, we, whatever we do today will be tomorrow's heritage, right? And so let's start pushing what it is that we want as a community and as a whole. And that's the only way we can truly fix the problem of information. Where, because right now the power is in our hands. Social media has made it such that we determine what is trendy. And so we now need to make sure that our history, ourselves, our heritage becomes trendy. Okay, any other question from the audience? The lady there? Thank you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? You're very, very quiet. Um, uh, the volume is a bit, just speak up a bit louder, please. Um, good afternoon, my name is Florence Adu. I am the CEO and co-founder of Leap Transmedia. We're a Ghana-based um, edutainment company. So I want to be a little bit um, contrary to your comments about how most people are getting their information. I know we're in social media week, but the masses don't have access to the means that you're expressing or, or the main ways that we, we know and understand. So to that extent, I think that we can't throw away the institutions, but we actually need to target those people within those institutions with this information. So it is the educators that are our targets to make sure that they are armed with the type of information and training. So beyond just making these stories available, I missed the first part of the conversation, and if I missed that, then unfortunately I'm repeating something. But beyond just creating the content, we need to train people to use the content so that it actually does reach the masses, because our problem is with the masses. Our issues are with the masses. It's not with us who are here and can have the conversation and seek out exactly what we're looking for. So in, in our part, we focus on creating content that is available not only online, but also on broadcast, terrestrial television, and on radio. And so to that extent, I would ask the panelists, how do we do a better job of that um, in the coming years? May okay. I? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So. When you talk about taking history to the masses, most, let me take Nigeria for instance, most communities, you are not going to tell them their history. They already know their history. It's when we want to put it in the formal sector, like the institutions, that professionals come in to begin to streamline. What I'm saying in essence is this. To take it to the masses, you have to look for other avenues. One, look at the first stack the Festival for Arts and Culture that was held years back. When you create such a forum, what happens is that you generate so much discussion, so much consciousness around that festival that promotes the culture and history of the people. Secondly, we must begin to promote the history of our heroes and heroines. Because in discussing them, what we call the great men and women in history, you can't discuss them in isolation. You will discuss them as they are relevant to the society that made them heroes and heroines. And then, we said it earlier, you also have to utilize the social media. The average shoemaker has a phone. Um, even the headsmen carry, what you call it, radio, transistor radios. You have to explore all those avenues through which you can get the information to them. And that is where the experts in packaging these things in the social media, through the radio and so on and so forth, come in. Once you get the content and you push it, it will, like I said earlier, it's not a quick fix thing. Over time, it will seep in, and then the consequence will manifest. It's a long-term project. You have to sustain it. You have to be patient to reap it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chris, I, I had something to add on that. I feel that we also have to acknowledge the fact that it is, um, or rather we need to advocate for convergence between traditional media and digital media right now. Um, but I also feel that it is equally important to um, 
first of all, be cognizant of what resonates with people or what appeals to people right now. So, for example, Tanzania, putting it into, into context, 44% of the population is under 25. Out of that population, out of 44%, you would have about 65% who already own mobile phones. There is no way I can reach those masses through traditional media. They're all about Facebook, they're all about YouTube, they're all about Instagram. So I believe that local specific context is definitely important in this particular um, issue. However, we should definitely go with the ages, you know, and go with what is happening right now and what is appealing to the people right now. Because as much as we would love to um, continue with the traditional media, it is definitely not trending. It is definitely not achieving that impact. I can tell you for a fact that publishing houses, newspapers, ha newspaper houses in, in Tanzania are struggling right now. You know, radios are struggling, although they have an audience in communities, local communities. Local community radios are actually the ones to go to if you want to advocate for community changes down to the grassroots level. So I feel like there needs to be tailor-made approaches um, to everything that we're also trying to address. And the same goes for what we're speaking about here. Just quickly add to what you're saying. You're very correct where we cannot throw away the institutions, right? But the question I'll ask is, do we have the institutions in the first place, right? My question is, how many, how many communities have schools, right? And then the people who are leading the schools, if there are any, how many of them actually know what needs to be done? So let me give you a very good example. Comic Republic is one of the first companies who started comic media in Nigeria, right? And just about last year, we got approached by Pan-African University saying, would you like to come and teach this medium in our schools? The only reason why they did that was because their students kept saying to the teachers, do you know Comic Republic? The only place we publish is digital, right? And because we've been able to influence the minds of the students, the owners of the school, the guys who built the institution, one of few in a country that doesn't have any, right, have now put us into their curriculum. And that's the way we can actually, reality, in reality, push this message across now. It's a problem of what we don't have and then meeting demand with supply, meeting them where they are and how they like to have it. And that way we'll be able to push this information to them. Thank you. We'll take one more question before we wrap up the discussion. Maybe the lady here? Oh, she? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Faith Odele. Uh, I, want, I would like you to talk about how we do not preserve our roots with integrity. So I'm talking about erasure, not only um, gender-related erasure, but even um, facts. So sometimes the hubris of the figures of history. We try to hide them, we whitewash our history. And uh, yeah, depending on, so how do we ensure that that integrity of history is preserved, especially because we're building new roots. So what used to be history uh, probably ended in the 1960s, but what happened in the 1990s is already history. And, and what happened, I mean, last year too, it's already History. So how do we preserve integ integrity? I'll give specific examples. We know about the Rwandan genocide. We know about the genocide before that and the history of Hutu versus Tutsi genocide. And it seems like we only want to tell one story. We don't want to tell the other story. Or even when we're um, back here in, in Nigeria, in some cultures of Nigeria, we don't want to talk about our role in slavery, for instance. Mm -hmm. How complicit our heroes and, uh, yes, heroines, if you want to call it that, were in what we know as the transatlantic slavery. Or we don't even want to talk about how exploitative some of our ethnic groups were, how they swallowed other, other communities, other identities, and oppressed them. It seems like we're whitewashing history. Can I? I think you're absolutely right. And I think that one of, one of the things that we don't do is we don't document. We don't document orally. We don't, we, we don't take the records of our, of our elders. And I think a, a, a mini way to do it for everybody is record your elders, your grandfathers, your parents. Just sit with them. Because we don't document at a micro level, it means that at 
a macro level, the historians don't have the data to work with and then put in and then look at academically. So we tend to just, oh yes, this happened, this happened. And you are absolutely right. I remember I saw a documentary um, about the events of June 12th. And I, I was alive at that time. But I, I was an adult, but I was shocked when I saw it. And I thought, oh gosh, yes, this is actually how it was. But if we don't, and I think that's something that I would um, encourage the professionals uh, to do. Encourage us, document, keep, read. Because even the social media um, elements, even the, even the films, they need books, they need documents to get the material from which they can then form into the content that is more easily consumed. Just to add to what she's saying, have you viewed DW's African roots at all? Have you seen any episodes at all? So one of the things I really liked about the project was how difficult it was for me to come to terms with the realistic portrayals of some of the things that Africans did, right? It's one of the things I was really excited about, uh, Dutchwellers' project on African roots. And I think it was because they were very unbiased uh, right? And so for them, they had no reason to whitewash anything, right? I saw some of the horrors that our people did themselves, right? And so maybe if we started, you know, collaborating with unbiased storytellers or platforms like DW, and I have to say that, and you guys can go and check it out yourself, you find out that you get a lot of the good and the bad. So that's the, my first answer to that. The second thing is, the truth is, if we don't hold ourselves responsible, Right? We need to take our account for ourselves. So as you've spoken up now, right, I'm pleading with you that if you see something our comic republic is doing and you think it's historically wrong, right, speak up. Right? The truth is if there's a demand for truth, we have no choice but to supply. Right? So we all have to come out, pick up the responsibility and censor this one and say, what you're saying is not the truth. You need to tell both sides of the story. And there's no media who's providing content. Right, that would not want to meet the demands of the audience if that's what they're asking for. Let me say this, and again, my views differ remarkably. First, I say your question, the facts don't sustain that question. History is a profession. You have experts who document our past. With regards to African history, after the establishment of the University of Ibadan in 1948, that documentation has been on. In fact, what Ibadan brought to the global community is the documentation of the African past by Africans. And there's a huge data. You think it does not exist. You think it is distortion. I give you an instance. I've put in 25 years as a lawyer, but I'm a professor of history. Hmm? Good. It was time to write the history of Nigerian Bar Association. My colleagues at the bar say, oh, Gogo, you write it for us. I gave them a bill. They all shouted, it's too much. I say, oh, because we all speak English, you go and write it and see how easy it is. It is a profession. It is a skill you spend time to acquire. It is me as a professional historian that will know if you ask me to write the history of your family, who and who I will ask questions. I've done the history of a family where they took me to their town, introduced me to the people I should talk to. I talked to them. They took me back to Lagos. I went back to my University of Ibadan base. Then two weeks later, on my own, I went back to their town and asked questions with other persons they did not introduce to me. Because I need a balanced story. Am I communicating? Those are historical Where the disconnect exists? It's between the histories we have researched in our institutions and the consumption of that knowledge by the larger society. There is a break. 
And that, again, is where the African Roots Project, such projects come into play. It is not that we don't have a true... Look, when politicians in Nigeria write about themselves and launch books, we get so much money for that occasion. But we historians know that that book is practically useless in terms of writing our history. When it's time to document that period of the person's history, we know where to go to. We know how to generate the sources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Unfortunately, our time is up. And I would like, first and foremost, to thank the panelists. Please give them a very, very warm applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for being a wonderful, wonderful panel. I also want to thank the organizers of uh, the Social Media Week here in Lagos, as well as um, uh, Lagos, Deutsche Welle, for making this possible. Please remember we have a quiz on African roots. Let's stop by the booth uh, next door. Uh, check it out, fill in some few questions, and you might win a prize. You never know. Thank you, and all those who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube, goodbye, and thank you for joining us. All the best. <laughs>